everything. Good afternoon all and welcome. My name is Anna Rowinska and I am your technical host today. Thank you for joining us for our webinar on cybersecurity and the IOT in the plant, new risk in industrial IT and machine safeguarding. If you're having trouble hearing, 
click, please click on the bottom left where you can see the microphone. Click on the up arrow where you can set various audio controls. Although your microphone is not enabled, you can ask questions at any time through the Q&A icon. Thank you to those who pre-submitted their questions already. If you wish to leave a comment, please use the session chat instead. We will invite our panel to respond to as many questions as we can during today's session. Our moderator today is Lisa McGuire, founder and CEO of the Manufacturing Safety Alliance of BC. Welcome, Lisa. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Before I begin, I'd like to recognize and acknowledge that I'm speaking to you on the unceded territories of the Stolo people that is part of the Coast Salish region of southwestern British Columbia. We are grateful for the opportunity to learn together on this shared territory. For those who don't know us, the Manufacturing Safety Alliance of BC is a nonprofit health and safety association serving manufacturers and food processors in British Columbia. We're here to provide you with health and safety advice, training, programs that includes health and safety system certification and resources to protect workers and help build strong, sustainable organizations. Automation and industrial Internet of Things technology is reshaping manufacturing. Smart sensors and devices can prevent injury, predict maintenance issues and improve productivity. But these same tech solutions can introduce new risks that you may not be aware of or have controls in place to manage. The speed of technological advancements are extraordinary. And today is about learning more about these risks and the impact to you, your people and business. The pandemic has created tremendous loss, but also opened up the opportunity to build new and valued relationships across Canada and abroad. Next Generation Manufacturing Canada is one of these new partners, and it is my pleasure to co-host this session with their CEO, Jason Myers. Welcome, Jason, and thank you for joining us today. As the CEO of an organization that inspires and supports manufacturers to develop new technologies, what are you seeing evolving in the manufacturing industry in Canada, and what impact are you seeing from that technology advancement for the safety and security of our businesses? Well, first of all, Lisa, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, join you today. It's our pleasure uh, on behalf of NGEN to, uh, to co-host this event. I think this is a, an extremely important issue. I, I just echo what you said about the importance of uh, digital technologies, advanced technologies in manufacturing. Uh, we are seeing, of course, uh, uh, digital tech that is contributing to health and safety, uh, to process optimization, uh, and, uh, and continuous improvement in, um, in operations. Uh, we're seeing at the same time, digital technologies uh, being incorporated in devices uh, and, and really playing a very important role and will play an even more important role in the future uh, in, the, um, in the future of autonomous uh, devices uh, as well. Uh, here, uh, devices that it, where sensors allow companies to gather information if it, regardless of the product, the process, um, uh, the, the nature of the supply chain, uh, companies can gather information from, uh, from these data platforms and use those to create new, new ways of contributing value to their customers and, and new ways of gener generating revenue. But uh, having said all of that, Lisa, I know I, you have, I know probably your, your next question as well. So what is it and what does it mean for cyber, what does cybersecurity have to do with this? And, and I, I wanted to, uh, again, sort of say how important this issue is because all of these systems, uh, new IT systems, operating technology systems and, and uh, uh, operating uh, uh, IoT and, uh, and connectivity, uh, whether it's within the facility, uh, across processes or within processes, uh, across the supply chain, Value the broader value chain connections with customers, uh, and and or embedded in devices themselves. These are all vulnerable to cyber attack and uh, and cyber threat, and that's really the uh, why cybersecurity is so uh, is so important. Uh, you know, Industry Week 
has just very recently uh, called manufacturing the low hanging fruit for cyber threat. And uh, if you look at the, some of the analysis coming out of the United States uh, have found that 29% of all the ransomware attacks reported so far uh, over the past, in, in 2020, over the past year, uh, were targeted to manufacturers. If you don't think this is, a, this is an important threat uh, to, uh, to take into consideration, all you have to do is look at the news. Uh, Bombardier, NBC, uh, Sierra Wireless, uh, Molson, uh, Home Hardware have all been targeted. And then you add that on to a list of international companies, including Tesla and Honda, and Nissan, and of course, uh, JDS, the, the last, or JBS, the last uh, uh, big attack that was, has been reported that shut down food processing in not only the United States, but in, uh, in Canada as well. All of these bring huge costs. It's not just the cost of paying the ransom, it's the cost of the shutdown, of restarting, it's the supply chain reputational cost, the, the cost of potentially losing a customer because of the disruption you're causing in the supply chain. Uh, it's the cost of, uh, of what happens if you, um, if, you un, you know, if, you're, if you're letting private information uh, out uh, into the public and, uh, and to, uh, uh, to many of these criminal gangs as well. Uh, and it's a broader disruption uh, cost uh, of uh, on the economy as a whole, but above all, it's there are some real damaging effects that uh, that could be uh, resulting from from a shutdown of health and safety systems uh, or devices that either shut down when needed, uh, or like a car, uh, or that are actually manipulated and can cause real health and safety damage. So for all of those reasons, I go back and I just wanted to uh, say. One thing, again, in terms of the risk and vulnerability, uh, we've been doing cybersecurity checks in our own organization, NGEN, and I can tell you, I, you know, we have good security systems in place, and uh, I've got a great uh, uh, leader on our cybersecurity team, but over the past month, we've received 14,500 emails, or around that number, uh, coming into our organization. Our security systems caught 590 phishing attacks. So if, if you don't think you're being targeted, think again, because you are. And health, the um, issue about cybersecurity, not only very important risk, but I think also we have to be aware that this is something that can be managed. That's what the panel is gonna be talking about today. Um, but it can only be managed if it's being taken, in, uh, taken seriously by everybody in the organization. And I think that's where and now, if you, if you uh, speak about health and safety, cybersecurity is in many respects, the new health and safety issue that, uh, that all manufacturers have to take into consideration. What an opening, Jason, and thank you. Um, how insightful and impactful, especially during pandemic times when all of us depend so much on technology for so many things. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to also give a warm welcome to our international panel joining us from Vancouver, London and Chicago with a wealth of expertise and experience and invite each of you to introduce yourself that capture your roles and work in the important area of risk. Starting with you, Roddy. Thank you, everyone. Uh, just checking that you can see and hear me. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Roddy Governor. I am a senior manager at KPMG Vancouver. Um, I really deal with a lot of our ethical hacking, penetration testing, and our technical cybersecurity um, issues with a lot of our clients. A bit of my background is that I've done a lot of globe hopping when it comes to cybersecurity in the past. Originally, I'm from South Africa, started out in our cybersecurity team over there. I did a lot of work in the United States and in London, uh, typically in uh, anti-money laundering and cybersecurity from that perspective. Uh, eventually went over to Europe and worked a lot in Ireland uh, for three years, uh, working in cybersecurity team over there, eventually landing back uh, in uh, Vancouver and handling our, um, our uh, cybersecurity practice over here. I also work a lot with our um, incident response team and our forensics team. Uh, typically what we do is we get a call, two o'clock in the morning, uh, a ransomware attack has happened um, and we will respond to that, that incident, help our clients through it. 
Um, in addition to that, I am the head of ethical hacking here in Vancouver, and I'm the regional lead for cyber defense uh, for KPMG uh, GBA. And currently, I'm on the board of directors for uh, ISAPA Vancouver. That's a quick little uh, story as to uh, who I am and what I do. Thank you, Roddy. Um, much appreciated. Uh, moving uh, on to, to the next member of our panel, Dr. Ryan Hartfield, all the way from the UK. Thanks, Lisa. I'm just going to share my screen very quickly for everyone. So bear me one second. And let me know when you can see my screen. Yes. Thank you. So uh, thanks for the introduction, Lisa. Uh, so I'm Ryan Hartfield. I'm head of cybersecurity research and innovation at CyberLens. Um, and also a, a senior uh, research fellow at the University of Greenwich, focusing primarily in, in uh, cyber physical intrusion detection for uh, systems um, like in manufacturing plants and intrusion detection in general, so proactive security. Uh, to give you a, a background about CyberLens, because that's really kind of centering on the context of this session, uh, CyberLens are a startup uh, specializing in, in AI driven threat detection. Uh, particularly for smart factor, uh, manufacturing. And, you know, our mission here is to, is to make cybersecurity, strong cybersecurity, accessible and practical for manufacturing companies that are going digital and starting to leverage some of these emerging technologies in IoT. Um, so to talk about how we're doing that and what, what my role is in that, because I'm part of a, a product we're developing uh, for the industry called Retina, um, what we've built here and what we are trying to do is, is make a, a, a threat assessment and detection tool that is able to work automatically to, to identify threats and stop them before they escalate to a cyber, uh, sorry, a safety incident. Um, without you guys having to have a full team of security experts, uh, without having to change, make changes to infrastructure, we all know these are the big blocks to, to the industry uh, leveraging cybersecurity technologies. Um, so to, to touch very briefly on those, um, to give you context and to shape the further conversation, because I'm sure these will come up, we utilize a number of ways of doing that. One of these is a concept we call cyber physical system visibility. Don't just think about looking at the cyber side, the network. Also monitor how your systems are physically operating. And that's what we take into consideration in Retina. Uh, automated approaches to early warnings of threats. So you can take action before those safety incidents potentially occur. And this idea of control aware response, which is if you take, take an action, um, the idea is that action shouldn't disrupt your production plan, right? It should be dis uh, it should be intervening in a way that protects safety at all times, or to minimize the impact. And to finish uh, very quickly on that part is one thing we do, which you, you know, manufacturers don't really know that much about is we, we upcycle data. Uh, that you're already producing in your manufacturing plant, uh, in your SCALA systems, because it's useful for cybersecurity, right? Uh, so don't just consider the fact that you're not producing data or having the systems to do some cybersecurity today. Their systems about physical behavior of your environment is valuable for cybersecurity, and we use it for that protection. And if people want to talk about it later, happy to answer questions. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Ryan. And our third panelist, Michael from Chicago. Welcome. How's it going, everyone? All right, let's share screen as well. Excellent. All right. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm Mike Chen. I'm Senior Director of Oman Solution and Technology Group, um, and I am based out of Chicago. So I've been in the industrial automation industry for 16 years, uh, starting off with tech support, applications engineering for PLCs, HMIs, networks, and software. Uh, my current team is out of GTA, Chicago, Seattle, and LA, as well as Amherst. And uh, we are really servicing the world in the industrial automation space with traceability solutions, control solutions, and motion. Uh, for those of you that have never heard of Omron, we are more than just relays and temperature controllers. Uh, we were founded over 85 years ago under the core principle to improve lives and contribute to a better society. So more specifically, since we're all technology people here talking about technology, is that our founder really believed that machines are made to work and people are really driven by that thrill of creation. And so our goal at the company is to um, contribute to a better future where there's harmony between human and machines. Uh, we're currently 6.4 billion um, and uh, really dedicated to technologies that address human needs and societal challenges. Automation is about 52% of our business. Now, um, in the industrial automation space, we have 200,000 different part numbers uh, spanning relays, temperature controllers, safety devices, vision, et cetera, robots, HMI, uh, 88 like you in the audience, maybe manufacturers, we self-produce and self-manufacture 80 plus percent of our portfolio. 
Uh, and we have three main drivers in our product innovation roadmap. Our products need to be integrated, our products need to be intelligent, and our products need to be interactive. So as we uh, bring out products that are either edge-based, fog-based, or cloud-based to you, um, in uh, whether you're IT or OT, we are always constantly thinking about that. Um, across the globe, we have a lot of solutions throughout for, for customers that are small and medium-sized manufacturers, all the way up through the, uh, the, the global mega giants of manufacturing. Um, some that do not have IT infrastructure capabilities or resources. Uh, so we are willing to assist customers in this area. And very importantly, local to BC, we have Sean Garrity, who uh, we welcome you to contact. He's here on the call and uh, can help me out with questions. And we will have upcoming white papers on traceability and technology that we're gonna be sending out. Uh, Sean or I can get you in touch with other appropriate contacts if you're from the other provinces. And, uh, and really, we appreciate you uh, having us. Thank you, Michael, and what a wealth of talent around the table here. Thank you all for joining us. Well, we've all seen the headlines and, and challenging outcomes for companies suffering a cyber attack. Jason mentioned that uh, in his opening remarks of just how many attacks are occurring. A quote from the recent headline notes that manufacturers need an active cybersecurity posture. Today, we look at the intersection between technology and risk. When you're using or considering automation and smart technology, factoring the financial, production, and safety benefits. So starting with you, Roddy, why should manufacturers be thinking about cybersecurity? Thank you, Lisa. I, uh, my position is that I think everyone should have cybersecurity on their radar, whether it's manufacturers, whether it's high tech, whether it's banking, government. Um, I think we are at the position today at this stage in the world where cybersecurity in terms of a risk is quite relevant um, and impactful to everyone across the board. From a manufacturing perspective directly, um, what we've seen is that the barrier to entry for committing cyber attacks is extremely low. It's in the past, we rolled back the clock a little bit and we have these very complicated cyber attacks that would pull off these huge um, and, and complicated uh, uh, operations in order to get you know, uh, money out of banks and these huge uh, uh, heists. That's not what we're facing today. We're facing that everyone is, is, is a cyber target and a cyberist is on the, on the radar for everyone. So from a manufacturing perspective, there's a lot of integrated systems. There's a lot of data. There's a lot of um, uh, people that are interconnected into those manufacturing processes that are also at risk uh, because of, that, uh, because of uh, that lower barrier to entry. What we find is that um, in the manufacturing aspect is that because there's a, that there's that safety element within the manufacturing plants, uh, uh, factories, that there's a little bit more of a risk as opposed to my data is gonna get stolen or uh, ransomware is gonna lock up our systems. It is extremely costly uh, for ransomware to affect things. However, if ransomware locks up systems that uh, protect your electrical grid, that protect your, um, uh, your uh, air and, and health and safety uh, systems. Those are potentially life-threatening. So we find in the, in the manufacturing aspect, uh, yes, there definitely this needs to be on the radar. It definitely needs to be taken seriously. Um, but then also there needs to be some sort of a drive from the top and the bottom down. We find that this needs to be something we should take into account from all, all aspects. Yes, no, driven from the top, key decision makers all the way from ensuring it, it's happening on the front lines. Um, absolutely. Ryan, can you talk about some examples of where we are seeing technology and cyber risk in production facilities? Yeah, and I'll follow on actually from what Rodney said here. I want to bring to our attention, let's say four examples, three are generally the same bordering on kind of the, the bar to entry, but I'll start with the more, more complicated one. Uh, in, in 2017, in a, in a petrochemical facility in, in Saudi Arabia, there was a, um, a malware detector called Triton. It's quite famous in the industrial control systems area, but manufacturing may not know about it. Triton was a malware which was very targeted. Um, it actually targeted directly um, Schneider Electric's Triconic safety instrumentation system. Now, I hope the manufacturers in the in in the, the in this uh, webinar will know what that is, right? Because it's about protecting safety. Mm -hmm. um, but what they did in this case was they was in the environment for a while, and um, this is a highly targeted attack, right? And um, they eventually uh, learned the environment inside out because it, it was very easy to get in. But they wanted you know, they have objectives. 
and they want to learn the environment and see what they can do. And eventually they learned the system they were using, they identified the safety instrumentation systems and they identified the vulnerability. We have to bear in mind these systems are around for decades and they have they're very difficult to patch and they cause downtime when they patch. And the first time it was spotted, the, the plant engineers thought it was a, a glitch. The second time it occurred in terms of the disruption, the attack against the triconic system, which this malware had targeted, uh, they, they brought the investigators in, right? And they actually identified there was a target attack against their safety system. If that had been, so the, the, the attacks had total control at this point, they could have turned it off and executed an attack that caused a health and safety incident, which would have been catastrophic. Fortunately, it was spotted. That's a highly targeted attack. And look on Triton if you want to learn more, Triton malware, Google it, you'll get the whole picture. Really fascinating high end of the spectrum. The bottom end is, you know, the old Mars water, water treatment facility that happened recently in Florida. Um, we heard about it that the uh, ultimately this, this water treatment facility had been uh, compromised. And one of the engineers looking at the, um, the their, their SCADA system uh, noticed that, uh, because usually they, they access remotely and they saw the mouse moving, that was very normal to them because they had a team viewer and they, and the people that are aware of team viewer, it gives remote access. And the mouse was moving and that was fine. Then it moved later and started changing the chemical balance. So it was, it was changing the amount of levels of lye. It was adding sodium, uh, greater levels of sodium hydroxide. And it got to the point where that could be even dangerous to touch. They immediately turned that off. Why did that happen? It goes back to what Jason mentioned right at the beginning. They had Windows 7 machines out of support, no longer supported by Microsoft, full of, full of vulnerabilities. But they also had sharing passwords, right? Um, across multiple machines, all installed with TeamViewer which was giving a big hole open into their environment. And it was, it was child's play for an attacker to get in there because all they had to do was do a bit of brute forcing on the team viewer login to get access to one of the machines. That was it. I mean, you can download something on Google now, do that in five minutes. And I'll show you a scary example later, right? But you see the upper end of the spectrum, some simple basic security that's just missing because it's not something that is mature, at least understood very well in terms of when connecting systems together and team viewer provides convenience. So hopefully that gives you some examples um, about the high, you know, the, the high target and the really basic low bar into entry. Wow, I mean that is really impactful. Looking at the potential outcomes of those potential disastrous situations, it's um, this is this is a very good discussion, and I think many on the line are probably looking at wow, how many of those points of entry are 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 vulnerable. Right in terms of not being controlled effectively, Re really, really excellent uh, examples. So, looking at safeguarding, you know, we know that safeguarding is a key factor in, in, in certainly in the manufacturing industry and in keeping production workers safe on the job. I mean, that guard is is absolutely the barrier between that blade and you know, as an example, and and the individual. So, Mike, what are some of the ways smart technology is being used in machine safeguarding to protect workers? Right. So um, while I know that the premise of today's panel is mainly around cybersecurity, ITOT convergence and everything, um, you know, members of your organization, MSABC, would know that, you know, machine safety technology is very clearly uh, supposed to keep humans out of physical harm, physical harm. Right. So no matter what data is being used or shared for IIoT purposes or SCADA purposes um, or what white or black hat actors are uh, accessing the machine or production systems, you know, the safeguarding technology on a running machine is, is designed to, uh, to make sure that the machine stops, this stops and de-energizes to address human risk uh, of injury. So on the machine, the technology includes basic intrinsically safe type of circuitry and product design um, where, you know, as an example, the, the standard relay shouldn't be used in a safety relay application. It's basic, basic just picking the right product. But also um, safety validation on the program so that as program, so that the product itself, the hardware product itself that um, a manufacturer might be using inside their machine, it would already know if there was any tampering to the program, right? So the program is validated when the safety is put in place uh, to describe, well, is, so that there's evidence and discouragement of tampering, right? Um, and even without uh, specific safeguarding, which implies adherence to safety standards, uh, the industrial automation technology has the ability to reduce some of that risk of tampering with hardware validation, as well as um, installation and replacement service. When you install or replace a different sensor, making sure that uh, the SKU number, or sorry, not the SKU number, the, the type, the model of that, uh, of that sensor is authenticated through the network, 
um, as well as the user program has a specific uh, execution ID where only certain programs can be executed by certain hardware. That, that all exists, that all exists. And all of this is by regulation underneath a risk assessment. So while risk assessments currently are still performed uh, exclusively and regulated by people, um, the smart technologies that are out there right now are helping people, people uh, and safety professionals service more customers more efficiently. And where experienced service members can identify safety risks, highlight them um, even remotely. And that's where some of the technology is really being focused on how do we get the right expert people from across Canada as well as uh, the rest of the world to, exam to real applications and evaluate what those risks are so that those, those, those chances for the machine itself to harm, that, that part is what we're really trying to mitigate. No, and that's that's a very important part. So, I mean, we, we talk about in health and safety engineering control. So if there's ways we can maybe disconnect from the internet to be able to um, shut down or protect or, or have some kind of an outcome or solution that would um, perhaps prevent entry. I mean, I don't know, I, I am not a technological expert um, by any means, but I mean, these are this is some of the thinking of, of finding ways to um, support effective controls. Ryan, what are some of the possible entry points for malicious attacks in a production setting and, 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 and maybe provide some context in this area? Sure, and we'll go back to the slides for this because picture speaks a thousand words, right? Um, so can you see my screen okay? Yes. Perfect, so I won't labor on this slide too much, but what I wanted to show is the, the huge broad um, ways of entry that, 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 that can be taken in terms of the production system. As connectivity expands in IT and OT, I'm not gonna use word convergence, I don't like it, I don't, I don't think it's the real thing, but greater connectivity, um, we end up seeing, let's say, uh, these, these, these entry points that we wouldn't usually associate. So for instance, um, the fact that we use managed service providers, right? Um, who might be, a, you know, they could be a Siemens, it could be anyone who have access to your environment, that, that manage your environment for you as part of that, your production systems or your supply chain. We've seen it with uh, SolarWinds and, and, and other examples where the supply chain whether it's software or hardware has intimate access usually into your production system, provide updates to your services, as well as what this on the top right corner here is, is industrial IoT. Um, where we're having greater connectivity with monitoring systems that require access to AI and compute in the cloud. So you can get that predictive maintenance solutions as well as traditional, your enterprise, how does it connect to your manufacturing system? Now, I don't wanna to spend too much time on this. You'll get a chance to look at more detail after this session, hopefully when the slides are shared, but I wanna show you an example of an actual, let's say a uh, real um, attack, let's say, uh, and I'm gonna play a video. So rest assured, what you're gonna see is a, it's a very small scale smart factory but it's all real technology. All the PLCs, all the HMIs, all the systems are absolutely real. And this is an example of what the impact that a ransomware attack can have in a smart factory. It's a couple of minutes long, so hopefully that's okay. Thanks, Ryan. So what, no problem. So what you're seeing here is basically a fully automated process on a production line, um, moving boxes and, and then doing some sorting. And there's some robotic arms as well as punching machines. And you can see this process is, is, is running um, and it's actually not, it's beyond traditional manufacturing in the sense behind this, which you won't see, is an automation controller, like an automation bus that is completely controlling this flow to, from the beginning to the end. And that's kind of the, the smart factory piece, um, because usually you'd have individual stations in the manufacturing production line that are intrinsically kind of individual processes that don't talk to each other. So this is a completely automated process with interconnectivity and greater connectivity that you'd see. And it will then now transition on to let's say an attack scenario. So, you know, production engineers, they use USBs, we move them between buildings, between systems. There's no such thing as an air gap. And sometimes, you know, the files might be infected on these. It's a traditional example. This could have been phishing. I could have showed you phishing. I could have shown you a number of other methods, but let's say you look at USB because we're, we're bridging the air gap, the humans. This infected USB opens the, the file uh, in, on the engineering workstation, which usually have, has privileged access in the manufacturing um, production line. Upon execution, this malware connects back to over the internet to an attacker server. It grants them access to the engineering workstation. All of a sudden, a ransomware attack has started spreading across other systems in the manufacturing zone. Files are being encrypted and you get the ransom note, you know, give us some Bitcoin. But what impact does it have indiscriminately on, on computers, intelligent computers that are actually running 
in the production. Industrial robot controllers are intelligent. They're basically PCs, okay? They're not like PLCs. They don't just have a CPU. They're, they're ultimately a PC. KUKA controller, it's a PC. Ransomware is indiscriminate when it's automated. Let's see what impact it has here. So what's happened is, is the ransomware process, what it generally does is kills processes on a machine to encrypt the file related to that process, okay? So it encrypts files. What has happened here is the ransomware has encrypted that particular uh, file that's helping that robotic arm move and it's completely broken the process. The robot has broken down and the thing is, and potentially created a safety incident. And this is what I want to show you. Now, what you're seeing there is impact, the impact of a threat that didn't belong, didn't originate, wasn't targeting the, the production line, but spread indiscriminately because like we said at the beginning, which Roddy said, right? Then it could be just um, a traditional threat that is spread. One more thing I want to show you. Uh, if I go to Shodan, many people will be familiar here in this panelist group of what Shodan is. But for the rest of the, of the community here, Shodan is like the hackers Google, okay? Uh, basically, what, are, what is exposed to the internet and, and, and what services are am I running? Excuse me. What I put in this search bar is targeting Canada as a country and this port called 3389. That port is for remote desktop access, okay? So when you use remote desktop to go from PCs to PCs, that's the port network port it uses. Let's have a search and see what's available. And it will take a couple of seconds just to load. Right, okay. So what you're immediately seeing here is a remote desktop computer, if I scroll down a little bit, that is uh, accessible and exposed to the internet. And as an attacker, I can grab this IP address um, and ultimately try to log into it uh, and try to brute force log into it. Now, it might be a honeypot. It might be there on, you know, for, for, for purposes of actually catching attackers. But you see the problem here. Now, if I scroll down and I won't, you'll find some usernames. Um, of actual users that are logged in and exposed. This is how easy it is. This is how easy it is to get that entry bar. And with that, just uh, in the interest of time, I'll stop. But hopefully that, that hits home the point. Wow, Ryan. I mean, that is just amazing at how simple a few clicks it look, you know, it is to be able to get in and um and cause damage. I mean, that is just remarkable. Roddy, do you have anything to add? Just seeing that example come to light and and that was a great demonstration there from from ryan and it really uh it really illustrates just how much is available nowadays to everyone not only uh malicious actors um i think uh, in terms of entry points it just shows you the sheer volume that's available it's just through a search engine let alone what's uh, being done through um, other malicious scraping scripts while we're doing penetration testing, ethical hacking, um, incident response, the most common question I'm asked is, why me? Why, why am I a target? I'm, I'm, I'm a small uh, operator. I don't have a large uh, facility. Why should I be a target? And why should I put a lot of uh, money into actually protecting uh, myself with the cost of cyber defense? And the thing is, like Ryan's uh, uh, search and uh, uh, showed and just showed us is that most often, no one is targeting you specifically. You are most likely just an open port behind an IP address. There's a lot of searches and scripts and everything going on in the internet in order to derive who is available on the internet, what open ports are there, what are the easiest, lowest hanging fruit in terms of what's not protected. And those go into a list and those go to start to be automated for, for attack purposes. It's very unlikely um, attackers actually know the name of the company by the time they actually try to break in. It's just another IP address on a list that they're trying to do. Once they actually try to break in, that's when they try and see what the value is. I think the really important thing that I want to disclose here, especially when it comes to entry uh, of attack, is that we have to understand that the complexity of the, 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 the cyber criminal underground is extremely complex. There isn't one person that's trying to hack you, that's writing ransomware, that's trying to lock up the factory, um, trying to impose danger within the manufacturing plant. There's dozens of groups of interconnected cyber criminal groups that all operate together and hire each other to do certain things. The group that's writing that phishing email that tries to get you to click on a specific link did not write the malware. The, the group that's trying to infect you with the, with the ransomware very unlikely is the one that's actually getting the Bitcoin from it. There's a lot of underground groups that are hiring each other in order to perform services with regards to criminal activity. And the one who actually gets 
entry into your system first is very unlikely the person is asking for the Bitcoin. So we have to realize that there's a, an underground economy at work um, that is in the business of hacking and making an entry into places. So someone who finds an open port on the search engine might go into a list and say to uh, other, his, um, his other uh, underground community, I have access to a, a specific company that has manufacturing capabilities. Who would like to buy that access from me? Someone with ransomware might be able to buy that access and then be able to escalate it even further. So we have to realize that there's a lot of hands that interchange throughout this. Very interesting. I mean, looking at a vulnerable opportunities and, and being a business or a market, I mean, absolutely um, clear for, for me to see just how much work we have to do to ensure it's controlled when it's an actual business that um, they're investing in to be able to, to get the product to sell. I mean, really insightful. So let's getting back to technology, security and safety and, and the intersection in today's manufacturing facilities. Ryan, you provided a, a really good example with that robotic arm and then the drop of that ball, um, potentially, you know, that could have, have rolled and, and, and hurt someone. Where else, and, and, and where do you see a connection between that specifically between health and safety systems and cybersecurity? And I'm going to do the, the sharing of the screen again, because this is uh, <laughs> the process I'd like to give you guys visualization. So I'll jump straight into this slide and please let me know you can see it okay. Yeah, I can see it. I'm going to take us back to first principles um, in terms of what is valuable in, in manufacturing, what is seen as valuable, what is seen as valuable. So value in the manufacturing process is what makes the product, okay? The bending of the metal or painting, the, the particular painting of the, of the product or the electrical component. And that's typically in the right-hand bucket seen as the, you know, the value bucket, right? The, pr the production value bucket. When we think about digital safety systems, even process monitoring or automation systems, that's in the waste reduction bucket. What does that mean? Is that actually these systems are used to reduce the waste in the process in order to optimize value. And obviously safety systems don't produce value, they reduce waste. They prevent functional safety incidents or safety incidents on product generation that would slow down, uh, create downtime and reduce, you know, take, take the system out of function and reduce value. But the problem is, is that cybersecurity previously hasn't even been seen in the waste reduction bucket. It's like, what is cyber, we don't need cybersecurity, we have a rare gap, right? But this isn't simply not true now. As digital safety systems um, start to have greater connectivity and we look at, you know, the uh, camera based safety curtains, no longer you're having physical safety curtains, but a, a, a depth camera that is looking at a pallet moving and looking at a human moving and saying, okay, they're too close, alarm, alarm, alarm. That's connected perhaps to a network that may or may not be air-gapped. And that's based on cost. Companies have this thing called HAZOP, which is your hazard operational risk plan that says, okay, can we afford to make this completely separate in a safety network or do we, are we happy to, on the order of risk, link it together in some of our network because we can't afford the whole separation? Um, Okay, that, that, that is gonna be different for different industries. So where does cybersecurity come into this mix? Well, as greater connectivity uh, effectively um, extends with digital safety systems, cybersecurity is also is, is effectively protecting the safety system. So you can see in this diagram here, cybersecurity is in the waste reduction process, but it's protecting the safety of, it will protect the safety of the automation, it will protect the safety of the process monitoring, but really important here, guys, is it will protect the safety of the digital safety systems, and, sorry, safety systems themselves. And that's really key. That for me is the major intersection, is that as they become gr more connected, as they are utilized for greater um, safety, uh, dynamic use of safety systems, cybersecurity is gonna protect that. Well, that's the, absolutely. And that's what we want to see. We want to make sure that that system is functional and effective to protect people, ultimately. Mike, uh, some thoughts on, on as well on, on the intersection. So agreeing with Ryan. Absolutely agreeing with Ryan on that. And um, maybe I didn't use the right terminology earlier, but uh, we definitely subscribe to a defense in depth type of strategy where we do expect our customers to think about how to separate out and segment different um, potential risks. And uh, for example, some of our hardware does have a um, built-in firewall that would protect or would separate, would separate out a, um, a network, a two, two network ports where one is connected to something that's more accessible by uh, worker PCs and uh, other network uh, items, but also a separate network that is firewalled inside the hardware 
to the uh, general automation products as well as the safety products. So again, the, the idea here is that regardless of what data is being used for any type of business decisions or business processes or interfacing to SCADA or et cetera, that needs to be separate from some of the other uh, safety devices and critical systems where the machine safety should not ever, ever depend on that type of uh, communication or any type of transmission. Um, I, I would think that uh, safety systems on vision uh, the standards around that would be pretty tricky to make sure that uh, that that was what Ryan's example was. But okay, let's let's keep going on that. Is that to uh, really make sure that uh, the safety technology does not rely on that transmission? Um, I, we still recommend all of our customers to have that assessment with a automation professional to see what exactly are the risk factors, what are the paths that people would take around this machine. And um, it's not just the intersection of IT and safety, but more that uh, there still are safety standards around how you need to position your systems, how you need to hard guard or uh, safeguard your systems in, digital, in a digital way. Um, for example, I mean, we are testing right now uh, 5G connectivity off uh, on our mobile robot technology at a customer. And uh, while, yes, we know that there is built in authentication on the 5G network, that, and that's an extra layer of risk mitigation, but still the essential safety functions of the robot are done completely within the product itself uh, by hardwired design, as well as the, the programming side, which, uh, which cannot be uh, accessed from the remote side. Excellent. And, and really looking at that as a risk assessment, I mean, um, absolutely, that, that happens and, and very commonly, you know, in health and safety risk assessments really set the, the stage to the controls that you put in place. And you have um, really a, a wealth of knowledge to be able to walk through what specific controls are, are needed to be in place when we're looking at this technology. So moving on to um, that particular subject, you know, recognizing that cybersecurity is more than, than an IT or information security CISO responsibility. Let's talk about, you know, the health, where the intersection between a health and safety professional um, and, and a CISO uh, intersect, because we know that that's an important relationship. So Roddy, within a business, how do people working in safety and in IT need to work together? Can you talk about that important relationship? Sure, absolutely. I think uh, traditionally what we would like to move away from is the finger pointing exercise of it's someone else's problem. In, in an organization, uh, a typical organization, most relevantly a manufacturing organization, it's very easy to say this particular party is responsible for cyber. It's an IT problem. If it's a cyber attack, it's a, it's a, it's a senior stakeholder problem. IT needs to fix it. Um, if we have a lot of sensors and, and, and uh, computers and uh, operating machinery in the manufacturing context, well, it's the manufacturer's problem of those machines that should make it secure, code it better so that it can't get infected with uh, particular viruses or malware, can't get infected. But that doesn't work because if we apply the concept of scalability to any problem, you'll figure out that that is incredibly hard to control and attackers have the benefit of time to figure out where the floor is. And it only takes one in order to make that one floor expand into many other floors. So there can't be a finger pointing exercise of one party needs to uh, resolve a particular issue. And if it's IT, it needs to be this party. But I think a cyber problem is an organizational problem. And it's really the concept of instilling cyber as a culture that really it, we've noticed getting, getting this problem working a lot, a lot better in the, in the long term. From, a, from an IT and a safety perspective, there needs to be a set of rules that work for both parties that have the objective of safety and the objective of uh, IT security um, that is compliant to both, but it is adopted into a set of rules that make sense for both. We need security instilled not only at the IT level and driven from the top down, but every employee needs to recognize why they are doing the things that they're doing. Um, there needs to be security as a culture. So if people bringing in USB sticks from their households into the manufacturing plant know this is potentially a dangerous issue and I could potentially infect the entire plant, uh, this is a no-go, that would be a good uh, stopgap to some of the major issues that we've seen before. 
Every piece of software that I install on my personal laptop that I connect to my corporate network opens up my corporate network to, to issues. That is something that needs to be taken into account. So I think that security and awareness, that, um, uh, that, that security culture needs to be done from the top down, but I think at every level needs to be taken into, into account and uh, be taken a bit, a bit more seriously. I think then if we drive a culture of security into the manufacturing plant, I think that is the greatest way to uh, handle this cooperatively, but uh, probably a bit more effectively. You know, really good points. I mean, you talk about a culture. I mean, absolutely. We're very familiar with that as, as a terminology utilized in, in health and safety. So uh, looking at that important intersection of a collection of behaviors that we get used to doing, um, when we learn a little bit more about that from a health and safety lens and looking at when, when do we have those discussions with, with experts on this particular and important emerging area. So talking about um, this technology and trends in our production facilities today, where do we need to pay attention for the future? Maybe starting with you, Mike, what digital transformation are you seeing in the industry today? So I wanna circle back to something Roddy said, I agree with that as well about, um, uh, about uh, making sure, I missed it, sorry. Uh, but overall, it was, a, it was an agreement to how we need to have that culture, right? The culture of safety and culture of security and also making sure to um, address local standards, right? So I think that some of the technologies when it comes to, uh, to the Canadian regulations are, are certainly going to be different than some of the other regulations around the world. So connecting with somebody local that can actually uh, advise our machine builders in the audience on some of these regulations, I think is gonna be pretty critical. Now on the industry, uh, the, the trends of the digital transformation today, really what I said at the very end of my introduction was that it's all about making sure that we're all being practical. We're all being practical. And as a, a machine builder, you need to consider what data, uh, what value are you trying to create for yourself or for your customer? And does a data strategy play into that, right? Um, some, of our machine, some of our machine manufacturers right now might not be advertising their machines to be connected at all. That's a possibility still. Right, but as they start to get connected, what data? What is the business? Uh, the business situation that data from the machine can be provided up to higher level systems. How can you create a defense in depth strategy with your customer to say that yes, we will allow our machine to be connected to uh, this upper level system. This is the data that will be supplied out, but there will be a firewall within my machine that allows for my critical systems to be maintained uh, a little bit separately so that we don't run into these other issues. Um, and then really from there, evaluating with the, with the application engineer what the technologies are that can serve that data or can um, uh, or what can provide that, that value and, and trying not to use the tech, put the cart before the horse figuratively, right? So like you see this really shiny new technology um, and trying to find a use for it. Well, turn it around and really make sure that you're looking at the business cases that you're trying to serve your customers with and, uh, and go from there. So consumer technology always leads, um, leads the, the industry in that there's an expectation that when you, you do your banking, you order stuff online on your phone, everything, um, that's the digital transformation that we want, that everybody wants to go to, but in the industrial world, it does warrant some time to just relax, relax a little bit, figure out what the business needs are of you and your customer to use data in this digital transformation age and figure out what, uh, what value you're bringing. So I'm trying to make sure that we, we don't go too overblown with it because I think that there is, is, is technology out there to serve specific business needs that we can talk to people about. Thanks, Mike. Ryan, any comments on that? And, and what are some basic steps you know, we, we can take to understand our risk level? Sure, sure. Um, so again, back to my slide because let's let's get that on on, on the screen uh, from Chrome's side. So um, look, when it when it comes down to to, to a, an early one hundred and one cyber security risk profile, like you, security starts with what you can see, um, and if you can't see it, then you don't know what to protect. And so it starts with the known knowns. And I'm not going to tell you to to read NIST. I'm not going to tell you to read all these compliance frameworks because. 300 pages of technical barbell isn't going to help you. But if you, if, you, if you think about the things that are going to help you have a plan, and these are three steps to a plan, let's say, become familiar at generally with you know, the entry points from business to, to production. And I'm not just talking about technology here. I'm talking about people and process as well. 
what and by the way i understand on scale it gets harder and harder right um but on, if you start somewhere then you can start to understand what are your what are your kind of crown jewels become familiar with the entry points just just write them down don't have to have great technology to do it but certainly monitoring and visibility is going to help with that task two profile your users and devices what are their roles what do they do and if they were to be impacted how would that affect production how would that affect safety even uh because if you don't understand that you can't have a basic plan and, and, and by the way, you know, I know it's been said many times, you need a plan. If you don't have a plan, you don't know how to react to minimize downtime and protect safety. And so become familiar with how you might, you know, how people come and throw, how, to, how devices come in and out of the environment, what their roles are, what impact they might have if they were compromised, and ultimately what your plan would be if that happened. And for me, those are the basic steps to get some picture of your visibility. Now, monitoring tools will help, but you can start somewhere. And that's going to give you a bit better picture of what you need cybersecurity wise based on just picking up a, a, a turnkey solution that costs lots of money, doesn't have value for you. Thanks, Ryan. I mean, simplifying uh, technical information is very helpful. It's useful for everybody and it gets us started. Let's go to the Q&A because we have lots of questions and it's great to see questions. First question, um, if these hackers don't necessarily know who they are targeting, just going for a low hanging fruit, then if the manufacturers are being targeted at a high rate, there must be a common issue that is making us vulnerable. What do you think it is that is making manufacturers particular vulnerable? Anyone in particular, Mike, okay. I'll take that one. So uh, mixed networks, right? So I've kind of dropped in the defense in depth strategy a couple of times now and uh, the need for uh, you know, it's very attractive to think that everything can reside on the same network, but you are opening yourself up as Roddy and uh, Ryan have talked about, you are opening yourself up for quite a lot of potential intrusion. So I think that while it, it seems quite nice to put everything on the same network, um, there is value cybersecurity wise and safety wise, human safety wise to consider uh, some amount of separation uh, into your network. Thanks. Oh, that... oh, sorry, go ahead, Roddy. Thank you. Just a quick, quick addition to that in terms of the actual technology that's accessible to public networks. I think what makes uh, manufacturing a bit, bit of a different scenario is that there's so many different systems running and that are interconnected to each other that make manufacturing a possible, a possible thing. Um, a lot of those technologies, and Ryan, you had this in, in some of your slides, are very old operating systems and technologies that are running some of those, some of those systems we have. Some of our previous attacks that we've seen in manufacturing that attack Windows 7, Windows XP, unpatched computers, um, things that are typically very vulnerable you wouldn't have in your office network but are running manufacturing systems. Um, I think those systems that are particularly vulnerable and publicly accessible is what makes this, this, this risk a bit more scalable uh, from a manufacturing perspective. Right. And, and Lisa, the last thing I say on that is look, it's not so much about the uh, the targeting. It's about who, where are the mature industries. Enterprise and in mature industries have been attacked for many years, right? So they've they've been hit hard. They've been stung, and they know. Okay, if, I, if we don't take these controls and these measures, um, we're going to be compromised. And I think, as like we said, connectivity to external systems and solutions um, increases in manufacturing for, ver for various reasons. Um, there isn't that digital skills or, or let's say uh, maturity. So. The, look at the old my water treatment facility in Florida. They enable team viewer on the internet with shared passwords that are very weak passwords. You'd never see that happen in a financial institution. Never, 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 never. So it's that's why is because actually the people that are coming, kind of, you know, the companies that are coming connected are the industries that have less maturity in the space. And manufacturing is one of those. And that's why we want to upskill and get better. Absolutely. Jason. Sorry, we can't hear you. Our famous mute. <laughs> I know how many times have we said that over the past year. Um, I, I really want to build on what everybody's uh, has said and, and add, add a couple of perspectives on what Ryan just said about uh, skills. I, I think it's important to realize that 95% uh, of all the problems arise because of human error uh, here. And going back to cultural issues, building this into uh, the way that people work is so important as a, as a result of, um, uh, of that. Um, combined with the, the idea that you know, processes are important, the technologies are important, but going back to something that Mike said as well, because it really resonates with us, uh, we're, uh, NGEN is in the, the business of trying to 
help companies make good decisions about the technologies that they are investing in and how they deploy those technologies. And what it really comes back to is a good business plan uh, and a really sound idea of process, uh, focusing on what adds customer value and what is what is less important in terms of adding customer value. And that's <laughs> that's you know basic manufacturing 101. Uh, here, you know, when we when we begin and going back to um, thinking about cybersecurity and and implications and management of that, I, I you know we've talked about a lot about risk and how that how manufacturers are vulnerable, and in some cases that's actually holding companies back from deploying technologies. And, and it's holding them back from making some of the decisions that they need to make in order to improve or grow their business. And it shouldn't be doing that. And I think one thing that uh, Roddy and Ryan and Mike have all, have all stressed is that this is manageable. Um, and it does begin with people, with good training uh, there. It begins with the culture and ingrained thinking about cyber. Uh, and it, it also requires though the use of technologies in a well-focused, way that's aligned to the business objective uh, here. And that's, uh, that's something that's important regardless of the technology uh, that is being used here. It's, uh, it's really where are the big risks? You know, basically, Lean 101, where's the greatest, where's the, what are the core functions? What are the core processes? Where are the greatest bottlenecks? Where are the greatest risks in here? And let's focus on, on those areas for, uh, for deploying technology but making sure that we've got the people and the processes in place to support that. And, and as uh, Ryan says, you know, we've got, uh, my experience is that we have a lot of people working on technology who think their job is only to work on that technology and don't see the broader aspects of how they work on that technology and how that could affect risk right across the enterprise. Thanks, Jason. Really insightful <clears throat> and important, you know, having a plan, ensuring that the risk assessments are done effectively in that plan that educate people to change behaviors because knowledge does that. And then we monitor it and we, we do our best to prevent an outcome that is, as we've heard on the front lines many times, disastrous. I mean, like we would do in a health and safety environment, you know, making sure we do everything we can to prevent a serious um, um, negative outcome to people. So I want to take one more question before we close. And we have lots of questions. So that is really good that we have lots of questions. It means that all of what was discussed is harboring lots of um, questions to all of you. So looking at what types of questions should we be asking our vendors about safety controls in the automation solutions and robotics that we're considering? Who would like to start with this, uh, with this question? <clears throat> so the Mike. Yeah. All right. So, so the types of questions that clearly uh, that we I think all three of us are saying is that um, what is the technology behind it, right? Is it Windows Seven? Is it stuff that's Windows embedded? Is it is it stuff that's been out there for a while? And um, and understanding that those will be inherently a little more risky, but at the same time, um, still ask. So the question was about vendors, right? Vendors or customers? Vendors or so in, when we're asking questions, oh, vendors, so those vendors, is spot, right? Yeah. Right? So that the vendors, the vendors of hardware and software technology, uh, making sure that they have a strategy themselves, right? That what, I think it's completely fair, completely fair to ask any of your vendors um, on specific products as well as services that they provide in order to help them uh, achieve the, as low risk as possible relative to their ROI, right? I mean, there's, a lot you can spend as well, but uh, depending on how much uh, how much ROI you're going to be invested, that's a, that's a big deal. And I'll just touch on top of what Mike said is that um, do ask because you know do, are people aware that the majority or well, very many vendors in industrial robotics space they have these big controllers in these fancy plastic cases with the logos on, and mm -hmm. it looks brilliant. What's inside it? I can tell you what's inside it. Ninety nine point nine percent of the time, it's a Windows machine. Um, it's a PC with embedded Windows and some serial connectors to the robotic arm, right? But it's a Windows machine. But many people don't know that, right? It's behind, in a pan fancy box. What does that actually mean in practice? It means that, to a large extent, it's vulnerable to all the other things that Windows are, is vulnerable to. And we all know this is a primary, uh, you know, most of the, the, the attack vectors that we see are targeting 
the when, it, when it's machines, we're not operating system. And so when you talk to a vendor, you say, okay, well, what you know, what version of Windows are you using? Windows seven. Well, why are you using Windows seven still? Because a lot of the processes for um, you, you know for keeping production systems is that they're very long cycles. They're very long software development cycles, hardware integration cycles. It's like cars, right? Built four years in advance before they actually land at the forecourt. And so the problem here is that there is there is definitely that challenge. And but it's about we go back to the digital skills and the awareness part. If you need to know what questions to ask. If you don't know what questions to ask, you're going to get sold a shiny box that inside is a Windows 7 machine, right? And I'm, I'm, and I'm obviously kind of ex exaggerating there. Know the questions to ask so that you can get what you need, both from a security perspective, but also from what Mike said earlier, from a value perspective. So a really good place to end here because I know we're, we're approaching, we are past the, the hour. So you mentioned resources and this is what will be packaged and circulated within the information that will be forwarded to all of the participants. And thank you all. An extraordinary discussion with a dynamic panel. We're privileged to have with all of us today. Thank you, Jason, Roddy, Ryan, and Michael. A big thank you to our audience for joining us. If we didn't get to your question, and I know we had a lot, we'll do our best to respond to some of them in the follow-up to today's session. This is the beginning of our learnings in this important area of risk. We will be organizing future peer sessions to enable you to interact in a virtual roundtable with experts. If you're interested in this opportunity, please let us know in the survey that will be circulated after today. Check our website for additional resources, webinar information, recordings, training, and event information. Thank you all for joining us. Please check your inbox for a survey link to share your feedback and suggestions to help us improve future webinars. We'll be emailing you tomorrow with a link to the recorded webinar, slides, and all of the resources. Until next time, take care. Thank you all.